In this video, we'll talk about integrals and introduce some vocabulary in the process. So, integrals, also called antiderivatives, can be thought of in two different ways. One is it's just literally mechanically, algebraically, the opposite of the derivative. So, for example, we know that the derivative of x squared is 2x. Well, that would mean that the antiderivative of 2x is x squared. So, in that sense, it's like the inverse operation of a derivative. That's just pure algebraically. Graphically, that's the other way to think about what an integral is, is it's the area underneath the, uh, any graph. So if you were to look at the graph of, let's say, y equals x squared, looks something like this. If I were to look at this and ask you, what's the derivative? Graphically, that's asking you for the slope at various points, right? So notice it's incomplete for me to ask what's the uh, what's the slope of this guy? I kind of have, if I'm looking for a number, I have to specify an x value. So if I were to say, what's the slope when x is 5, then that's asking for the derivative when x is 5. Now, on that note, if I were to ask you what's the integral of this graph where x is 5, you know, the so integral is talking about the area. So really, it's asking what's the area underneath this function, underneath this red function, and above the x-axis. And so notice here, it's actually incomplete even for me to ask you what's the integral, uh, you know, what's the area underneath this function at x equals 5. The area underneath one point is like nothing. I need to give you a range, right? So if I were to ask you what's the area underneath this function between, let's say, 3 and 5, then basically that's, uh, it would be the area underneath the red curve, whatever that function is, above the x-axis and between those two x values, between that bound. So really, uh, notice that for most functions, if it's like a curve, we won't really have a ready-made formula like we do for rectangles or triangles to find the area. So in that sense, the integral lets us find the area underneath something uh, that we might not know a formula for. So that's conceptually what integrals are. It's the area underneath any curve, starting from this value, going to that value. Or on the other hand, it's just talking about the function whose derivative is that thing. So how do you know what it's asking for? And that's the difference between a definite integral and an indefinite integral. So a definite integral is the area interpretation. So the, a definite integral looks something like this. So this squiggly line, so first of all, just notation on the integral. If I wanted to ask you, what's the integral of x squared? I mean, what's the, so that problem I just did, the area underneath x squared. Um, I would basically, here's how I'd phrase it, I'd say the integral, that means integral, uh, of x squared, because that's the function under who I want to find the area. So the integral of that, and then I always put dx. And so what that's doing is that's specifying what the variable is. Here, this might have like a letter in there, like an a or a y or something like that. So this is letting me know, part of what this is doing is it's telling me what what letter in here is my variable as opposed to just some arbitrary constant. So this, so in a way it's sort of like the stuff in between the integral symbol and the dx or dy or dp or whatever your variable name is. Uh, anything that's in between those two is the guy whose area you're looking for. Like you're looking for the area underneath that guy. Or it's the guy where you want to find whose derivative is x squared, right? So that's just notation there. Now, additionally, if I were to have a number here like a to b, so first of all, the way to read this out, out loud is to say, what is the integral from a to b of x squared? So that's how to read that. So here, looking at this question, this is an example of a definite integral. What makes it definite is it's specifying these two x values. It's specifying find the area starting from an x value of a and ending at an x value of b. So here, this, this graph, uh, this definite integral, what it's asking me, the way to read this is, find the integral from x equals 3 to x equals 5 of 2x. And so what that means graphically is it's asking me to find the area underneath the line y equals 2x. So the area underneath that line, intercept of 0, slope of 2, right? You know that line, 2x. It's starting at 3 and ending at 5. So in a way, notice, I don't need calculus for this because it's a straight line, which means this area is going to be like a trapezoid, right? It's going to be some shape that I could find without using calculus. So this I could solve without calculus. 
But as you'll see, you could solve it with calculus, and you can kind of verify that you get the same answer. We'll do that in a sec here. But that's what this is. This is area underneath the curve. That's what this is. That's what definite integrals do. So notice what this will simplify to give you. This definite integral. This is equal to a number. This is not going to equal an equation. This is a number. It's sort of like if I were to ask you what's f prime of three versus f prime of x. f prime of x is an equation. f prime of three is a number. That's specifically the slope at one point versus this is the equation that always outputs the slope. So that's the difference between a definite integral and an indefinite integral. So a definite integral is like the f prime of three equivalent. It's giving me numbers here, and so it's gonna simplify out to be a number, and it is literally interpreted as the area, versus an indefinite integral. An indefinite integral is basically the same thing, except I'm not given that to and from. So that's like if I were to just ask you f prime of x. That's not going to simplify all the way down to a number. That's just going to simplify down to an equation. Similarly, an indefinite integral is going to simplify down to an equation, not just a number. And the interpretation is it's the antiderivative. It's the equation that will, uh, whose, you know, whose derivative is, in this case, 2x. So let's, uh, let's look at a rule and then we'll do some examples. So first of all, the power rule. So the power rule, for integration. This is the, the analogy here is the rule for derivatives where the derivative of x to the power of n was n x to the n minus one, right? We just take the exponent down and we subtract one from it. So here, this is the opposite direction. If you wanted to find the integral of x to the n, you're basically gonna add one to the power and then divide rather than multiply by the new power. So for example, and notice there's also this plus c here, which I'll talk about in a sec. So first of all, let's just answer a question. Let's answer the question, what's the integral of x squared dx? Let's do the simple one first. So again, what this is asking me for is it's uh, x squared is my function here. And so I'm asking what function in the world gives me the derivative of, uh, of x squared? So well, let's see, let's just use this rule first of all. We bump up the power by one, so instead of two, you bump it up by one. So notice I, uh, with the derivative, you first take it down, then you subtract one. Here we're going purely opposite, so first we're adding one and then we're dividing. So I first add one, to make that a three, and then I divide by three, which is the same thing as a one third. So if you prefer, you could think of it as multiplying by one over that new exponent. Notice it's the new exponent, not the old one, right? So I'm not gonna divide by two, but rather by three. So anyway, the cool thing about integrals is if you're good at derivatives, you could basically always check your answer. If you found that the integral of this guy was this guy, you could just take the derivative of one third x cubed and make sure that you get back x squared, because if not, then you made a mistake, because that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find what's the function in the world where if I take the derivative, I get x squared. So if I take the derivative here, the three comes down and the one third stays there. So three times one third times x to the power of three minus one is two. And then the three and the one third cancel. So I'm left with just x squared. So that kind of works. So I know that my, my uh, answer was right, that it's one third x cubed. But here's where this plus c comes in. What if I were to ask you, what's the derivative of one third x cubed plus a hundred? Well, the derivative of this term we just saw was x squared. But then the derivative of 100 is zero. So the derivative of one third x cubed plus 100 is also just x squared. Same with one third x cubed plus one 1,000 or 10,005, or really you can add any number here and the derivative of this whole thing will still equal just x squared. And so ultimately, if you wanna give the broadest answer possible, instead of just giving one of the infinitely many answers, Let's give what the structure of any answer would look like. Any guy whose derivative is going to be x squared is going to be one third x cubed plus could be any constant in the world. Let's just call it c. So c is a placeholder for any constant. And the reason we always have that is because if you're trying to ask whose derivative is x to the n, you could always add a constant and it won't change the derivative at all because constants drop when you take a derivative, right? Constants that are added, that is. So you can always add any constant 
a lot will change your answer. And so that's why for any indefinite integral, we're always going to have a plus C in our answer, right? So let's, let's answer, let's apply that to this problem. So here we want to find the integral of this term of, of, of this polynomial x squared plus x plus 10. So let's just go term by term. The derivative of x squared we kind of just saw is one third x cubed, right? I just bumped that up by one and divided by the new exponent. The derivative of x is, let's see, I bumped it up by one. So this exponent of one becomes two. So that's x squared, but then I divide by two. So that's one half, right? So one half x squared. And again, if you prefer, you could write this as x cubed over three plus x squared over two. Same thing, that's the same thing. And then finally, plus 10. And here's a common mistake that people make. They get back into the derivative mindset and they say, oh yeah, this goes away because right plus 10, the derivative is zero. But remember, we're not trying to find the derivative. We're trying to find the guy whose derivative is 10, and that's going to be 10x. So anytime you have a constant added in your in, un, under your integral, then the integral is just going to be that constant times your variable. So if your variable is just x, it's just going to be that constant times x. And then, as I said earlier, once you're done term by term, then you just add a plus c at the end. So now, again, you can check our answer if you were given uh, you know, a derivative problem saying, take the derivative of this thing that I've boxed in blue over here. Well, the derivative would be, the derivative of this term is x squared. The derivative of this term is just x because the two comes down, cancels with the one half. The derivative of 10x is just 10. And the derivative of c is zero. So there you go. So that sort of checks, proves your answer. So that's how you find an indefinite integral. Let's now do this and Let's see how do you deal with these numbers over here. What if you have a, a uh, definite integral like this, meaning one with numbers before and after? So the good news is the way to solve a problem that's a definite integral, you start off doing the exact same thing as you do with an indefinite integral. So you first just use the power rule or the exponential rule or the log rule or, you know, basically it's just those same rules in reverse. So you use the rule that you need to to find the integral, and then you'll do one more thing, which I'll get to. So here, first of all, let's just do this. So you might you might just know this from memory. All right, whose derivative is 2x? Well, x squared. But if I want to be more systematic, if that didn't come to my mind, I'm just going to follow this procedure. Remember, so the 2 stays there, then the integral of x is x squared over 2, right? Because as I just said, you increase that by 1 and then divide by the new exponent. And then you can cancel this two with this. So that's that's how you could show that you just get x squared. So this is really x squared and then plus c, right? So the integral of this is x squared plus c. But if it's a definite integral like this, then you won't need the plus c. And I'll, I'll explain why um, uh, in a sec. So first, let's just do it without the plus c. So here's what you do. Here's the new step. Once you find the antiderivative of your function, here's basically what this is saying. So remember, this is saying the inner integral, the area underneath uh, this function from x equals zero to x equals four. So the way you write it is this. So you put a horizontal uh, line, a vertical line, sorry, to the right of that function once you find the integral, and zero to four. So what this is saying, this is saying, all right, I wanna, you know, I took the integral of this, and so I, I wanna find the area underneath this guy from zero to four. And so what you do is here, you basically plug in this top guy into this guy. So you top, plug in the top so you get four squared minus, and then you plug in this guy, zero squared. So let me just write, write down the actual procedure then. So the integral from A to B, if this is like the derivative F prime, is going to be you take the you know you take the antiderivative and then you get f and so it's f of b minus f of a so essentially what it's doing is you first integrate and then to actually see what the area is within this range you just take the difference in the y value meaning the output of that antiderivative so you take again this guy the output at b minus the output at a not of this function but of the antiderivative so here you're basically saying what's the output when x is 4 minus what's the output when x is 0. 
not of this 2x, but rather of the x squared. So into the x squared, I first plug in the 4 minus, and I plug in the 0, and so here I get 16, right? Because 4 squared is 16 minus 0. Notice here we can kind of verify, we could verify that the answer is 16 here by just old school finding the area underneath the curve because this is a straight line. And we know how to find the area underneath a straight line. If this is a straight line, it has the point 0, 0, and at 4 the slope is 2, so that's 16. Sorry, uh, yeah, um, 8, sorry, because the slope is 2. So it's, so the area from 0 to 4, from x is 0 to 4, underneath this line, is this, right? And so this 1 half base times height is going to give me 1 half, the base is 4, the height is 8. 8 times 4 is 32, and half of that is 16. Ah, the area underneath this guy is 16. So just to give like a more visual analogy of what's going on here is here, if we wanted to find the area underneath, you know, this line, 2x, from 0 to 4, we could either just take this area, or usually that's not available to us if it's like not a straight line. We don't know what the area is underneath some curvy thing. All we need to do is in the antiderivative, so the antiderivative of x squared is, of 2x is x squared. So this is the y equals x squared function of parabola. Here, you just look at the difference in the y value. So here, what's the y value when x is 4 minus what's the y value when x is 0? And the change in y value of this integral is the area underneath that derivative function, right? So that's... Uh, so that's like just more conceptually what's going on. But yeah, and so that's how you could find a definite integral. Just to recap, you take the antiderivative, and then into the antiderivative, you plug in this, and then minus, you plug in that, and that gives you the area underneath this guy. So uh, one final example here. Let's say we wanted to find this antiderivative. So here's where almost every function that you might encounter in introductory calculus usually can be simplified into a power function, right? Like if you have a square root, like root x, that could be written as x to the 1 half, and then the power rule applies. Or 1 over x cubed, you could write that as x to the negative 3, and then the power rule applies. But here, even though you can write this as uh, 10x to the negative 1, right? Because you could bring this x in the denominator to the numerator, and the problem is the power rule doesn't apply because let's try to apply it. What we do, remember, is you bump up the power by 1 and then divide by the new power. When you bump this up by 1, you get 0, and then you divide by 0. That doesn't make sense, right? So you essentially get an undefined in this case. And so this is just like an exception, uh, and that exception is always this, is that whenever you essentially have x to the first power in the denominator, then the integral is actually the log, the natural log. So the integral of 1 over x is actually just ln, right? So the ln of x, which makes sense because the, the derivative of ln is 1 over x, right? So it sort of makes sense. So here, um, technically there's an absolute value here, but I'm not going to get into that technicality now. For most purposes, you, uh, it's not that helpful. So here, for our purposes, for, for this example, the integral, first of all, um, another rule, by the way, here is whenever you have a constant that's multiplied, into your, in your, uh, under your integral, you can actually pull it out. So you're actually allowed to pull out constants. Uh, you can't pull out variables, but if it's a constant that's multiplied, then you can pull it out. So here, first thing I do is I pull out that 10. So I could pull out that 10 and I'm left with just one over X, right? And then the bounds here were from five to eight. Um, notice here earlier in this, this two X problem, I could have also similarly pulled out that two and then just done the integral of x, which is basically what I did, right? The constant, the two just sort of chills there. So here, this 10 is just going to chill there. So this is just the 10 as is, and then the integral of 1 over x, as I just said, is the ln, the natural log of x. And the bounds here, this goes from 5 to 8. So to evaluate this, I just plug in the 8. So if I plug in 8 for x here, I get 10 ln of 8, whatever that is minus, then I plug in the 5, and then I get 10 ln of 5, whatever that is. And so yeah, this is a number minus, this is another number, take that difference, and that difference is your answer. That difference will give you the area underneath this guy, underneath 10 over x, whatever that function looks like, whatever that nonlinear function looks like, between x is 5 and x is 8, that area is going to equal whatever this number 
simplifies to do.